In 119 BC, Emperor Wu of the Han Dynasty nationalized the mining, smelting and casting, and salt extraction industries in China. This gave the government a monopoly and prevented private businesses from operating in those areas. Tadakuchi 都是有朝廷的控制了割草不痛就是说连这个连连草都割不动嘛根本又动，老百姓根本都割不动，国有农的话呢，他就只能是国老大嘛，他只能是就就他不实用，他造出来的器物，他只是要要要收钱。The tremendous impact of government policies on merchants meant there was a lack of reinvestment of private capital. Under these conditions, people began to invest large amounts of capital in land, which was a safe and profitable commodity. Social and economic realities and the government's policies to suppress commerce made land the most lucrative investment in what was an agricultural country. These factors prompted large-scale land acquisitions during the middle period of the Han Dynasty. One of the most respected scholars of its day, Dong Zhongshu, wrote to the emperor saying, Now the rich have fields as far as the eye can see, while the poor are without even a scrap of land. Xi Han, from this, uh, 土地兼并开始发展也想解决这个问题。那么兼并势力当中有一种人，就是商人。他们经商挣了钱，然后大量购买土地，所以他们是土地兼并中的一种重要的势力。According to records of the Grand Historian, in 106 BC, 400,000 landless peasants suddenly appeared in the Central Plains. To the people of that time, having no land was equivalent to losing one's livelihood, and the emergence of 400,000 starving landless peasants closing in on the capital left Prime Minister Xu Qing with no option but to tender his resignation. This was the first time such a thing had happened in Chinese history, and it shocked China's rulers. The 
government ordered some of the rich and powerful to relocate to less populated regions near the capital. This move would have killed two birds with one stone. On the one hand, it weakened the power of local forces, and on the other, it increased the population in the area surrounding Chang'an. But the emperor hadn't expected his great general Wei Qing to intercede on behalf of one individual. The emperor was obviously very unhappy about this. That a powerful general could unexpectedly plead with him on behalf of a man in the street showed the influence some so-called common people actually had. The person who the general spoke for, Guo Jie, is described in historical records as being extremely ruthless. He killed many people as a young man and gradually grew to become a local tyrant. Many people of influence in his neighborhood were eager to make his acquaintance. On one occasion, someone praised Guo Jie, calling him a chivalrous warrior. However, a Confucian scholar who was present did not agree with this appraisal. The man was later found murdered with his tongue cut out. Officials summoned Gorgia, who pleaded ignorance of the matter. He was later acquitted. Gorgia became very powerful and he acted with impunity. This attracted the concern of the government and clearly something had to be done. Consequently, the authorities had Guo Jie and his entire family killed. This was an era when despots were emerging in many regions. These despots had huge amounts of money and colluded with officials. They were, in fact, the earliest criminal gangs in Chinese history. The government quickly realized the serious danger these local despots posed to society and resolved to suppress them using brutal means. Public order in one county in particular was in a terrible state, and so the emperor appointed a new strict chief called Yi Zong. There were more than 200 criminals awaiting execution in the county's prison. Regulations allowed the relatives of such prisoners to visit them prior to their execution. The new chief deployed soldiers to the prison to arrest the relatives of prisoners who came to see them. In total, he arrested over 200 people on the false claim that they intended to help the convicts escape and then he executed them along with those on death row. Afterwards, the people of the county were gripped by terror and no longer dared to oppose the authorities.
In 119 BC, due to the war with the Xiongnu, the government forced all citizens to pay a capital levy of between 3% and 6% of their total assets. However, the authorities quickly discovered that the majority of the property class opposed the policy and were concealing assets so as not to pay tax on them. Tishin 我们现在是巴不能够上什么无人富豪榜啊in response to this, the emperor came up with a solution that would today be considered unimaginable. Anybody who reported someone for concealing their wealth would receive half of the perpetrator's wealth and the state would take the other half. This was an historic struggle between the government and landowners, with the government using all the tools at its disposal to seize wealth from society. After this policy was announced, many rich families had their homes searched and went bankrupt. It is recorded in the Book of Han that homes were searched across the country and that the middle classes were practically wiped out. Jingsa 这个事情带来很大的后遗症in short, the government allocated land to the people and reduced taxes, including head tax. It also encouraged people to set up private businesses and develop the private economy. Within just 50 years, there was great accumulation of wealth in society, and the nation grew stronger. But not long afterwards, the emperor launched a protracted war against the Xiongnu, and this rapidly consumed the wealth of the empire. To meet the huge levels of military spending, the government adopted policies which suppressed merchants in an attempt to garner money from the people and nationalized the salt and iron industries. The government also resorted to violent means such as raiding people's homes to amass wealth from taxes. All this resulted in the collapse of the economy as well as wealth accumulation in society. Unable to get rich through commerce, people began buying up land. Land became concentrated in the hands of the few 
which produced landless peasants and tyrannical landlords. The polarization of wealth became increasingly stark. Towards the end of his reign, the emperor realized how much the war he started had harmed the economy and how some of his excessively harsh methods had exacerbated problems within the empire. He published an article in which he expressed regret for some of his policies. What are the laws governing the rise and fall of empires? Throughout history, no emperor, including Qin Shi Huang and Emperor Wu of Han, were able to uncover the answer to this mystery. It's now the year 3 AD. In the capital Chang'an, officials were working tirelessly in the Prime Minister's office, sorting and counting the seemingly endless boxes of bamboo slips that were arriving. The office had received nearly 500,000 of them. At a time when horses were the primary mode of transportation, a petition written on 500,000 slips of bamboo would have pushed the government's resources to the limit. The petition carried one message expressing the ardent wish of the people, that the government confer the highest honors upon the new commander of the Imperial Guards, Wang Mang. The people's support for Wang Mang was sincere and sometimes even fanatical. The petition quickly evolved into a large-scale demonstration. In the Book of Han, it was recorded that members of the royal family, officials and ordinary citizens alike spontaneously descended on the capital and waited day and night outside the palace gates. The imperial court had no choice but to send out messengers to assure the crowd that the government would immediately confer on Wang Mang the highest awards. And this announcement sent the crowd into rapturous applause. As the people had lost all hope in the Han Dynasty, they thought Wang Mang was the right man for the highest office in the land. In fact, however, the end of the Han Dynasty can be traced back a further three decades to the reign of Emperor Cheng, when the empire had already begun to show signs it was faltering. That year, Emperor Cheng issued an imperial edict on crime, in which he confessed to the reasons for there being so many landless peasants in society. He followed this by pointing out society's many problems and blaming corrupt officials for social unrest. According to the Book of Han, the emperor's tutor was a powerful landowner in the central plains where he owned more than 2,500 hectares, all of which was in the most fertile areas on the banks of the Jing and Wei rivers. Top ministers owned huge tracts of land. They were almost as rich as the emperor. They were, in fact, the most powerful men in the empire. The 
Book of Han states that Emperor Cheng's uncle Wang Li seized several thousand hectares of prime farmland in Nanyang Prefecture, which he then sold to the government, earning him 100 million copper coins. Back then, one copper coin could have bought a small bucket of rice. If calculated against the price of rice today, he would have made 240 million yuan. Considering the state of the economy, the purchasing power of 100 million copper coins would have been far greater than 240 million yuan today. This uh Worse still, following the death of one of the emperor's favorite courtiers, Dong Xian, the government discovered he had amassed a personal fortune of 4.3 billion copper coins. Using even the most conservative conversion rate, today it would be worth around 10 billion yuan. Even more astonishing is that he had only worked in the palace for four years and was only 22 years old when he died. For thousands of years, spending on the royal family and officials were the two largest expenditures in the government budget. The government itself was an interest group whose money ultimately came from exploited labor. However, society could supply only so much surplus labor and the government over exploited the people. This inevitably led to fierce conflict between the haves and the have-nots. Government corruption also caused it to lose its ability to govern. The local tyrants described in history books were the first instance of criminal gangs in Chinese history. And there was little the government could do about them. Yuan Shu was a local tyrant who had supporters across the central plains. His power attracted the attention of officials. One day, while his servant was out buying meat, he got into an argument with the butcher. The servant grabbed the butcher's knife and hacked at him before running home. The county chief wanted to use this incident to restore the government's authority. He dispatched troops to arrest Yuan Shu. However, he had underestimated Yuan Shu's power. As they faced each other, a group of local outlaws suddenly appeared that greatly outnumbered the local officials' troops. They wanted the county chief to let Yuan Shu go. Caught in a difficult position, he was unsure what to do. But then Yuan Shu's men came up with a compromise solution. In the circumstances, the county chief had no choice but to withdraw his troops, and the matter was therefore quietly concluded. The one government official called Wang Yogong felt Yuan Shu was way out of line and he hoped to bring Yuan Shu to justice. Yuan 
不如拆掉他手丧的屋子，逐条上奏他的罪行。这样做后，元赦就不敢轻举妄动了。Yuan She learned of this and sent assassins to Wang Yogong's home. He ordered the assassins not to ransack the house. Don't be surprised by the old woman. In another room, the assassins killed Wang Yogong and his son. Yuan Shu was China's first gangster, and he had hundreds of killers at his disposal. They were even prepared to kill officials. In the year 22 BC, the commander of the armed forces, Wang Feng, was seriously ill. His nephew, Wang Mang, was at his bedside to care for him night and day. Wang Feng was touched by his nephew's devotion. Just before he passed away, he praised Wang Mang to the emperor, who gave him a minor role as an imperial attendant. He was 24. Wang Mang read all the books he could find and grew to become one of the foremost scholars of his age. At home, he asked his wife to wear simple clothes rather than elaborate dresses. In fact, visitors often mistook Mrs. Wang for one of his servants. Wang Mang and his wife were devoted to each other. He did not take any concubines. In the year 2 BC, Wang Mang earned the great respect of the people when his son caused the accidental death of a family slave. He ordered his son to accept responsibility and commit suicide as penance, despite the fact that it was not considered a serious offense at the time. Wang Mang's achievements quickly spread throughout the empire, and as the dynasty began to crumble, Wang Mang emerged as a saint who, in the minds of the people, was the embodiment of morality and justice. The frenzied acquisition of land by corrupt officials and local tyrants, heavy taxes and the polarization of rich and poor had led to extreme social unrest. One of the senior officials wrote to the emperor to point out the reasons. 气候变化无常，水灾、旱灾频繁，是迫使人民死亡的原因之一。县级官吏严厉的追讨赋税、租税是原因之二。贪官污吏假公取私、收取贿赂是原因之三。豪强地主对百姓剥削无度是原因之四。酷吏给百姓强加徭役，人民没有时间种田是原因之五。村里一名工，不分男女，都要上街追捕盗贼是原因之六。强盗劫取百姓财物是原因之七。百姓有七种死法而没有一条生路，希望国家安定，真是太难了。Corruption among the ruling classes, the weakening authority of the government, social unrest and the people's hardships led to the collapse of imperial rule. The big change eventually came. In January of the year 9 AD, 
Wang Mang formally ascended the throne and established the Xin dynasty in a successful coup. Wang Mang's ascension was supported by the vast majority of the people, having become their last hope as the Han dynasty collapsed around them. In the first year of the new dynasty, Wang Mang promulgated a famous and controversial decree on land redistribution. In the edict, Wang Mang analyzed the shortcomings of the land system up to that point. Chilingbai He proposed the world's fairest land allocation system. Couriers were sent from the capital to every corner of the empire to inform the people of the government's land reform measures. Yeah,改革,但是外戚又阻挠,而且外戚的阻挠的力是力很大,不搬开这个半角石,改革没有办法推进的。The Xin dynasty considered the private buying and selling of land as the source of inequality, and that the policy of privatization of land which had taken place in the previous 200 years was wrong. The government now implemented nationalization, which meant that all land belonged to the state. The authorities believed that if each married couple had 6.66 hectares of land, every citizen had land. And if the government took only one thirtieth of their harvest as tax, then the people would be content and there would be peace throughout the empire. Traditionally, China was an agricultural country that relied on revenue from the land. The agriculture tax was the material basis for maintaining the country's political and social life. Wang Meng's land redistribution system guaranteed that the people owned the land and that the government collected taxes directly from the people. It also guaranteed that people would not be exploited by landlords. This was therefore a utopian style political system. Two thousand years ago, the Xin dynasty would not have been aware of the great changes that had taken place since the start of the Han dynasty. The greatest change was its population. In the year 2 AD, the government conducted China's first census. China's population was registered as 59,594,978. At a time when horses were the only means of transport, the census would certainly have been a monumental undertaking. The population had increased almost sixfold from 10 million at the end of the Warring States period. However, 
In the intervening 200 years, the total area of farmland in China had only barely increased. Wang Meng's temperament was more like that of a scholar than an emperor, and the land redistribution system naturally displeased government bureaucrats. For landlords, the various decrees banning the buying and selling of land restricted their ability to make money. As for landless peasants, the promise of free land was very tempting. But who was going to give them this land? The good intentions of the land reform simply did not tally with real life. As a result, Wang Meng's policies upset every level of society. It was only a matter of time before it fell. the following year, the ferocious Yellow River overflowed its banks flowing across Shandong province, foregoing its former course in Tianjin. And records note that one-fifth of the population was killed as a result. Those who survived the floods became refugees. Looting was rampant, and many people took the law into their own hands. Eventually, they united to form an army, and they applied red paint to their foreheads to distinguish themselves from government troops. They were called the red eyebrows. The natural disaster was the start of the collapse of the Xin dynasty. Within a few years, the uprising had toppled the empire. The government had shown it was unable to resolve the land issues left over from the previous administration, much less the polarization of rich and poor. Its failures were simply a continuation of the failures of the Han Empire. In his dealings with foreign powers, Wang Meng relied on his Confucian learning to determine his policies. Wang Meng believed the Xiongnu chiefs had not conformed to proper etiquette, and he alienated himself. This intensified the conflict between the two sides. Meng's troops fought frequent battles with the Xiongnu as well as a war with the Wang rebel army, and it eventually lost. In October of the year 23 AD, the Red Eyebrows took Chang'an. The Book of Han says that Wang Meng wore court dress as he quietly waited for his final moment. With him in court, for more than 1,000 officials willing to give their lives for the emperor. During the subsequent fighting, a merchant called Du Wu killed Wang Meng with his sword. Wang Meng's body was then hung up in the street, and locals came out to hit his corpse and vent their anger. The angry mob had already forgotten that just over 10 years before they had taken to the streets to voice their fanatical support for the saint. They now blamed him for all their misfortunes, and it seemed to them that his death would put an end to all their misery.
Now, let's look back and re-examine the course of the Han Dynasty. In its early days, the government granted land to the people. This was the first time in Chinese history farmers owned their own land. The government kept taxes low to ease the people's burden, and the government also allowed the people to develop the private economy. With policy support, the people's enthusiasm for production reached an unprecedented level. People accumulated great wealth. By about 100 BC, the Han Dynasty experienced a period of great strength. The Han was the second dynasty to unify China. Apart from the short-lived Qin Dynasty, it had almost nothing to emulate in terms of exercising state functions. One of the functions of the state was to maintain social order and mitigate class conflicts in order to safeguard the interests of society as a whole. But at the same time, as an empire, the state became a special interest group that relied on state power to wantonly plunder society. In its final days, the over-exploitation of society by the authorities led to the collapse of social order. In the course of developing a free economy, the private buying and selling of land was another factor in the dynasty's downfall. The foundations of China's peasant economy were extremely weak. Peasants often faced bankruptcy, which meant the wave of land acquisitions could not be contained. The government's inability to stop this led to the polarization of rich and poor in society. While bureaucrats and landlords owned vast swathes of land, the poor could not afford to put roofs over their heads or clothes on their bodies. As peasants lost their land, they were reduced to begging, which ultimately led to repeated rioting. With widespread calls for social reform, Wang Mang's ascent to power was a reflection of the people's aspirations. Wang Mang's most important policy was his attempt to return all of the land to the state and use state power to share wealth equally. But due to the check and balance of various interest groups, he was unable to implement his reforms. The empire fell into a paradox in which it needed a bureaucratic system to govern the country, but it did not have the necessary means to stop bureaucratic interest groups from plundering the nation's wealth. Allowing land transactions and encouraging competition would only lead to land acquisitions and social polarization. But returning land to the state and sharing wealth equally would go against people's competitive nature, and it was too good to be true. It was the first time in history a Chinese government was faced with such situations. They went out of their way to make it work, but failed in the end. It wasn't the first time this had happened, and it wasn't going to be the last either. Over the following 2,000 years, not even the greatest dynasties were able to escape the fate of the Great Anne.